Father God, we are here for you. We came here to this place of worship to honor you, to lift your name high, to remind ourselves that it's all about you, that it starts with you and ends with you, and there's lots of dust between. But Father, you have lifted this dust. You have lifted, lifted us and you placed us with your people in your heavens. Father, you look at the dust and you said, I will redeem it, I will save it. I thank you, Father. You're a merciful God. You're loving, you're kind, and you want all to come to your kingdom. Amen, church. Amen. It's good to be back. I mean, what an ordeal. I felt like a trained monkey going to Ottawa. And I'm serious. In one hand, I loved it because I could experience how trained monkeys feel. In another hand, I hated the experience because no one wants to be a slave. No one normal wants to be a slave. So it started with a few months ago when I was invited to go to Ottawa and make a speech. I mean, if you remember, uh, last year a patriotic group invited me to the Parliament Hill to make a speech with one condition. That I would not mention God, that I would not pray, that I would not preach Jesus or mention of any biblical references. And I said, then why are you calling me? You have, obviously you have a wrong guy. Because I cannot separate me from God. Or God from me. It's impossible. You cannot do this. Or I would be like so many other pastors, schizophrenic. With putting a hat at the church and taking it off and putting another one at the hockey games or other places. It can happen. That reminds me of the story with some uh, bunch of friends. We went to the theater, movie theater, and you know, going to a movie, it's a relaxing time. It's an entertainment time. So obviously, most of the Christians are taking the Christian hat off. I mean, after all, we're there to relax. We're not there to preach or to talk about Jesus. We are there for worldly reasons, just to be entertained. And this fella that came with me, and there was a bunch of us, he was shocked that I would not stop preaching when the opportunities were emerging. You know, before the movie and after the movie, there are always opportunities, so I would just be me. And if there was an opportunity to talk about Jesus, I would. And if there was an opportunity to challenge someone about being hard for Jesus, I would do that. And he looked at me after and he says, I've never seen something like this before. He grew up in a church. I said, what do you mean? Well, you were the same like you are in a church. I said, what did you expect it me to do? He says, I've never seen it before. It's like, I thought we were there for entertainment. And I mean, you leave that stuff behind in the church or at the street ministry, right? Where you actually go to preach. And I said, is that not a schizophrenia? Yeah. If you're a double bipolar individual, you know, you go somewhere and you leave what you actually believe in behind the doors. I mean, that's craziness. So I'll never forget that experience. It was very interesting because that's how we are supposed to live. You know, I understand that there are situations when you know that the Spirit is telling you this is a time to be quiet. There is, believe it or not, there is a time to be quiet. There is a time to withdraw yourself. We see this in Jesus' life on earth. There was a time when multitudes were coming to him, multitudes, and they were waiting to be healed. And instead of healing them, he withdrew himself. He went to another town. There is a time for everything. And of course, right now, Peter was talking about what's happening here in our beloved Canada. There is a time for peace, but there is also a time for war. An enemy engaged in a war. The uncircumcised Philistines 
have invaded our nation and they are taking everything around us, turning us into slaves. So when a few months ago those people invited me to come, I'm thinking, do I really want to go? God, do you want me to go? Do you want me there? The second thing was that the restrictions. So I was meditating very heavy. I'll have to put a mask on the airplane. That would be the first time I ever did it, and I hated the idea. And I was debating within my heart. I said, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. So I've done some research, and I look at my options, and there was not many. Either you put that stupid thing on your face, or you don't fly. And walking to Ottawa was not an option. I will come back in 10 years. I mean, during the time of Jesus, uh, that's what they were doing. Uh, but, you know, we have to ask always God for the wisdom. Do you want me here in Calgary or do you want me in 10 years to come back here? Um, and I would miss the speech anyway. So that was in my heart. I said, God, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to put that thing on my face. I don't want to submit to this ridiculous hypocritical order from the government. But what do you do? And I felt peace. I felt that really God wanted me to go. And sometimes, sometimes you have to do something in order to get you somewhere. And apostles were very good at it. You know, you got an apostle that would shave his head. Remember that? I mean, there was, why would you do that? But it was a custom. So he did. He did the extra mile. He, he did submit it to the craziness of dead religion in order to win some for Christ. Yeah. And I know Derek, David, and all of us, we had a huge problem with this. <laughs> huge problem with this. But we did it. The first thing you do, you enter the airport and you are subjected to this Chinese virus. Because with the Chinese virus, Chinese ideology comes. Dictatorship, everything is attached. Don't kid yourself. We're being invaded by China. We are being invaded by China. That's why they want that stupid thing on your face. Because they are wearing it for decades now. If you don't see it, maybe you need to clean your glasses. Or put a different one, a different shade. Not the colorful one, you know. <laughs> that you see everywhere right now, you know, the six colors one, glasses. So as we entered, we received the masks. You know, I talked to Dave before, and I said, Dave, do you really have to? I said, you have to. Or you, they will block you. They will kick you out, and they will ticket you. You know, you will be arrested. OK, there we go. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, let's try to see how trained monkeys feel like. So we put the masks on, and now I know how the trained monkeys feel like. Horrible, terrible. You can't breathe. Normal people do not wear masks unless you're in a surgery, in a hospital, and you have to, to save lives. It's ridiculous. It's unbelievable. So as we are marching there, and everybody are trained monkeys, just like us for that moment, and then we spotted some that are not trained monkeys, and I could not figure it out. Is the law for everyone or not? As we were walking, we saw a big restaurant, and everybody eating and drinking and having a good time, no masks. No masks. So I did a little video over there. You can watch it for yourself the double standards, the hypocrisy. As long as the money is flowing, as long as we need the business going, your know, $40 steaks being sold, I mean, you don't have to wear a mask. Uh, mask. And I'm thinking, what a smart virus. I mean, incredible. This virus is out of this world. It knows where to stop. I mean, you got, you got a hallway and some people are wearing masks, or sitting, some are not, and then you get the restaurant and you're next to it and you don't have to wear a mask. And the only difference that I saw, that it might be why the virus is not allowed to cross over, is the color of the tiles. There is no other explanation. It was just different tiles, you know? So the tile that you had to keep your mask on, it was light color. 
And then there was a, you know, Black Lives Matter, the black color of the tiles. And I'm thinking, this is political. The virus knows that the black matter people will rise up against the virus and beat them up and burn them and, and loot them and stole all the virus's money. So it has to stop. The white tiles are for the trained monkeys. And then you got the darker tiles and the virus has to stop, has no other choice. The government said so. So I call this super intelligent, out of the world virus. And I'm thinking to myself, it doesn't make any sense, but you know what with the devil, when it does. Show me one instance that it makes sense with the devil. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It doesn't make any sense. Another thing is that it says that the masks are not preventing you from getting the virus. So why wear them? It's right on the box. It says on the box in English. If it was Chinese, I get it. I don't speak Chinese, I don't know, Ching Chang Chong, I mean, I can't tell what is saying there, but it's in English. And it says, it does not prevent you from getting the virus. So why wear it? I'll tell you why. Because they're conditioning us. They're preparing for something a lot bigger. It's a war and we are invaded. We have been invaded for a while. Peter was touching today on the subject of a protest, defund the police. Can you imagine living anywhere in a world where there is no police and the villains can do to you whatever they please and there is no one that you can call? Can you imagine that lawless, evil society? It's unbelievable. That's what those people want. I am for authorities. I am for police. I have always been a law-abiding citizen, when, after I got saved, of course. I have to add that, <laughs> if you know my testimony. I will be called a liar. I love law and order, because my father is law and order. There's no chaos in the kingdom of God. You see, chaos comes always with the devil, and that's what the devil wants, and that's what those people want, Antifa. Black Lives Matter, all those craziness we see, Chinese government, they want lawlessness in order to bring chaos. Chaos into society, dictatorship, hate, murder, rape, everything else. And you're listening, I hope. So, what is happening? What is happening to our country? We're being invaded, we're being taken over, but I think the most important thing to understand for us what is going on, we are being judged. We're being judged. We're being judged as a nation. We're being judged as a church. So we went over there and we did, you know, little videos and we had some good laughter, but overall it was a sad, sad situation because we have been subjected by evil, wicked government to put something that everybody knows it's not working, but you have to wear it, you have to have it just because we say so. So we're sitting in a plane and you know, it's very hard to breathe. It doesn't make any sense. When you watch the doctors, they're telling you that you breathe stuff out and you cannot, you should not be keeping it. That's why you breathe that out. But breathing this thing back in, it's actually causing sicknesses, the virus. You know, every person should be immune to viruses and the body, the God, the God created, is designed in such a way that fights all those different things. So when you breathe stuff in, the body kicks it out. But now it can't. It's going back into your system. So it's causing more and more problems. I'm telling you, after this is over, it's not over yet. There will be tens of thousands, if not millions of people sick because of that. Not because of the virus, because of the wearing of the masks. And that's what they want, depopulation and all kinds of different things, vaccination. Another thing that I learned through this experience is that most of the people, 99% of the people have no problem to submit. 
What I saw is that most of the people are not believers, and I'm talking about Christians, and they're terrified for their lives. Is that not the interesting that we always talk about, I can't wait to go home, I can't wait for Jesus to come back, oh, I'm ready, I mean, if he comes, finally I can really live, and everyone wants to go to heaven. And again, we talked about that yesterday, heaven is not our final destination, it's just a bus stop until Jesus brings a new heaven and new earth, a new Jerusalem. So let's put this doctrine first, that we have been always destined for earth, never for heaven. Heaven is not our ultimate home. But let's put that aside. We all want to go to heaven, spend eternity with Jesus. But then the virus comes and no one wants to die. I mean, what changed? We all want to go home. We all want to spend the time with Jesus. Lord Jesus, come. Come and take me. He says, okay. I will. I listen to your prayer. Okay, I will do it for you. And then we say, oh, Lord, I'm sick. I'm dying. Help me. Rescue me. Well, you ask me to take you home. Are you schizophrenic? You don't know what you're praying for, you know what I mean? We all are ready for a departure, and God says, here is the ticket, and says, now give it to somebody else. So that's what I witnessed. And I needed to witness that. I needed, I needed to be subjected to this craziness. It humbled me, because me, being me, it's not easy being me, sometimes. Because immediately I wanted to fight this. I wanted to reject this, I wanted to resist this, but I had to wait. Do I want to go and be there, or in order to be there, you had to jump like a good trained monkey? So we did. We were treated with a great respect, which was amazing in Ottawa. They put us into their homes, they fed us, they even gave us a car. We were staying in a lady's house, um, and her husband, uh, Stephanie and Bill, and they were incredible, absolutely incredible, patriotic, Amen. lovers of this country, lovers of God. And um, the next day we went to the rally. It was in sun over 40, and I was a Kentucky Fried Chicken, <laughs> very quickly, and we had to rush. Because the speech, I was to be the first speaker, and I thought to myself, okay, they're probably putting me first, and then as I'm speaking, the crowd will get bigger and bigger and bigger. You know how people are, right? Yeah. Just like some of you. They come half an hour later. So that's what I thought. <laughs> you know, that uh, I'm the first speaker until the crowd gets bigger. But I was surprised because there were thousands of people at the parliament. The police officers are estimating and don't jump yet when I said that. They estimated that 10,000 people showed up. By the way I looked at it, it was maybe two, 3,000, no more than 3,000 people. But it's still a lot, if you think about it. The thousands of people decided to come against the law, against the pandemic, pandemic or whatever you want to call it, not wearing stupid masks that do not work, but come together as patriots from all provinces and all walks of life, Christians and non-Christians together, coming together. And then I was really surprised when they asked me to pray in a, within a leadership group right there in front of all those people. So we prayed, we prayed in the name of Jesus Christ and then I was able to deliver the speech. I don't know if you heard it or not, but it's it's on the internet, you can, um, you can see it, you can uh, feel the heat, and you can see me going like, oh my God, I'm dying here. I'm on fire. <laughs> the whole nation is getting on fire, but why you put me on fire? From inside out, I was like someone would throw you into a swimming pool, that's how I felt. And I, no one from the team was good enough to give me a little towel or a portion of their t-shirt or something. So I was like, oh. And then I find out afterwards what the tie is for. I've never could understand why you have to wear a tie. Now I know because you, it saves your life when it's 40. 
and in the sun, and you can see I'm all burned. I'm like, I was fried completely <laughs> afterwards. So I preached, I thank my wife. She helped me write the speech about the flag, about the history. And you know, Canada Day was called Dominion Day yeah. until I believe 12 misguided demons in the parliament called members of parliament decided when everybody else was missing from the parliament to change to Canada Day. You see, Dominion Day, the meaning of Canada comes from the Bible and they hated the Bible, so they needed to remove that and they did. I think it was 1982. Twelve people. Twelve people changed the name of this great country. Can you imagine? That's why we have to be vigilant. That's why we have to stand up for our country. We have to push. We cannot just go home and do nothing. If we do, we will go, we're going to lose more and more and more. And afterwards, I think I was more surprised than before when they asked me to pray. Because I had hundreds of people coming to me nonstop, all the time, thanking me for the speech. I mentioned Jesus. I preached, I talked about God and the heritage, and I even touched the holy cow of Canada, the homosexual perversion. And yet they were coming to me, thanking me for the speech. That is someone that is standing up. So why I'm telling you this? Because I believe something is changing in this nation. Amen. I think they've tried politics. I think they've tried being just patriotic. I think they've tried all kinds of different things, but it's not working. You see, without God, nothing will work. Without God, you're doomed. Without God, there is no hope. And they've seen it. I think they've tasted it. And now they're coming to a realization. We've got to go back to the Canada that it was. The Canada that was built by the founding fathers that were Christians, believers. That the foundation of this country was always built on Judeo-Christian values. On the values of uh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Either they like it or not. It changes nothing. The truth remains. This country was glorious and free because God made it that way. He protected this nation. And then we walked away from him. And when you walk away from God, you lose the protection. You lose the favor. And now Canada is under judgment. And that's exactly what we see. I was greatly encouraged. Sometimes we're calling, you know, we did the call to repentance, right? We're going to do it again probably a week from now. There's another message that God wants us to articulate. And you know, sometimes you're thinking, where are the pastors? Where are the leaders? Where are the churchgoers? What's wrong with them? I mean, how much more will they wait until they will wake up from this slumber, from this happy dream of prosperity? But there is very little now. You think, what is it going to take for them to rise up? Well, I guess a lot more. Because it's very hard to find leaders these days in the political arena and in the church. We were discussing, there were street preachers that came, people from all over. Uh, and a very interesting thing, because if you were following the pandemic tickets, the COVID tickets, yeah, I got, and Derek got, and there was another fellow that got a ticket, $880 ticket, for having a, uh, what it was? Passover, Passover in his home. Yeah. Yeah. So he was there as well. I mean, incredible people, people that are willing to pay the price. And, and you know what? Whatever the devil is saying, they're not paying attention to that. They're paying attention to what God is saying. And God is saying, get ready, embrace yourself because more is coming. This is not over. More is coming. They're already planning about September, October, and November to do another crackdown. Mandatory mask. Again, the mask that do not work. Right? Because that's the demon. That's the devil in a land. Submit or else. Preparation for the mark of the beast. The time is coming when they will say to you, you cannot buy or sell. Have you watched my video at the Apple store? Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, is that not incredible? You cannot go and buy anything in the Apple store right now because they're part of the beast system and you cannot enter and you cannot sell or buy. I mean, is that not obvious? That's how it's going to play in the end. That's how they're going to force you to comply. It's coming. It's in our faces. In some places, you don't have a credit card, you can't buy anything. 
That's right. And there's many places you cannot park your vehicle with that credit card. You know, it's unbelievable. A total control. Total control. So after that, we, we spent some time around. We talked to lots of people. Sandra was there. Uh, Kevin J. Johnston was there. A few other people that I uh, know. And some of you remember them. We had them for conferences. And um, Carr was there. And um, Rick Boswick, you know, and others, Norm. It was uh, very, very good to see the Patriots, people that are willing to stand up and fight. Not some of them are not fired up believers, but you know what? If they are not, if they are not against me, they are for me. Yeah. You know, that's not what Jesus said. Yeah. Oh, they're doing this and this, and they have wrong motives, and you know, they have not been with us. But yeah. if they're not against us, they're for us, yeah. right? So we had a great opportunity to be there on the ground. I think that we have done what God wanted us to do. We declared the word at the Parliament Hill. Now the nation has no excuse. And I want to thank so much for the team to coming with me because you see there is two can do a thousand, but 10 can do 10,000. There's power in unity. There's power, there's strength when we travel as a team. You know, so Derek, Dave Hughes, my brother David, Gabriel, the cameraman, he was, um, it was hard to find him sometimes <laughs> in the crowd. And uh, Larry, our mayor, was there as well. Yeah, singing at the Parliament Hill. Amazing grace at the Parliament Hill. And you have to serve somebody at the Parliament Hill. You know, like a declaration telling the nation you will have to serve somebody. You have to. Either the devil or God. Incredible. So I want to give, uh, I want to open the mic uh, for the team to share what they felt, uh, how it was. So Mr. Mayor, you want to start first? <laughs> or you want to go last? You see, this is a smart man. The last shall be first and the first shall be the last. I mean, you can't beat a man of God, you know. Um, it's very hard. You're a tough opponent. So I'll ask Derek. Derek, come and share what's on your heart and it was a good trip thank you so much for the prayers thank you that you send us there with your blessings because i believe we have accomplished what god wanted us to do and the reception was incredible they treated us with honors and uh, wow what a difference sometimes you go through the streets and uh, we walked with my wife we went for a walk and they were homosexuals walking you know like demons speaking you know, uh, but over there, the patriots understand, they understand the value that you bring, the foundation, the love, the true love, not this artificial, yeah. wicked, yeah. evil, perverted lust. It's not love, it's lust, yeah. you know, but the real, real deal. So, uh, Derek, let me uh, give you some, uh, some power. You know, this zaps you every 10 seconds. That's why you're so on fire when you preach. <laughs> Well, thank you. And I just want to thank you, Art, uh, for the opportunity to go to Ottawa. Yeah, it was incredible just to go with the team and to get everybody, to get to know everybody more. <laughs> I remember before we went, I was talking to Dave on the phone and he was bringing up the issue of the mask. And he goes, yeah, so on the plane, we're going to have to wear the mask. And I just got quiet. <laughs> and he goes, Derek, I don't think this is a hill to die on. And I just started laughing. I said, you know what, Dave? I agree with you. I don't think it's a hill to die on. So, <laughs> that's like Ark said, it's either you wear the mask and go, or you don't wear the mask and you don't go. Try to drive. I was actually thinking, like, man, if I start driving now, how long would it take? Now? There's no way. So yeah, you know, Art, Art shared a lot of the details of going through the airport and the hypocrisy and the double standards. It's just, it's so, it's just silly. It's just, it's comical. <laughs> some are and some are, and it's enforced there, but not there, and <laughs> what is going on here? So, yeah, I just wanted to share a little bit about uh, my perspective and my experience there. Like, yeah, we got there a little bit late and rushed, and I was, I was filming, and Art was, was a fiery speech, and like he said, he, he was like on fire himself, wearing his suit there. He was looking good, but he looked like he jumped into a swimming pool. 
And oh man, it was so hot that while I was filming it, his phone just stopped recording because it was that hot. It's just like I said, like temperature emergency, and that was it. So then, fortunately, I could substitute with my other phone, but that, that gives you an idea of how warm it was. I think it was 30 at least, and with the sun out for the most part, just beating down on us. But yeah, it was very encouraging, yeah, with the Patriots, with the Christians, with the street preachers, that everybody that came out and gathered, yeah, a couple thousand or so, two, three thousand. And you know, for once, I, I didn't feel like a minority. Like when you go to the streets and you're, yeah, and, and you go and you preach and you go and pray and you represent Christ, you're always a minority and you always feel like that. But going there, that was the first time I didn't feel like the minority. And I doubt, I highly doubt everybody was 100% for Christ or, or on fire for the Lord. Definitely there were some people, but, but those, those people that were there, they weren't persecuting us. They weren't persecuting the street preachers. And like I said, they were actually congratulating. And so that was so, so encouraging. Um, just to see these street preachers just not holding back and everybody we got our our crazy shirts on with our messages like repent or perish or repent to be converted or you know repent to believe in the gospel and judgment is coming and the wrath of God don't let it be upon you like guys brought out all their shirts and the boldest messages and I was just I was encouraged by that I, I loved it and they were with their megaphones and just preaching at their tents and their signs and standing up on this fountain buddy there was uh he was a pastor and a little bit of his testimony i heard from one of his team members that he was a heroin addict and just a colorful background and but but doesn't doesn't preach in the church preaches on the streets too for the last 30 years kind of like art and i just thought man that, that's incredible brought a, a solid team out and like i said they didn't hold back and and i didn't hear any resistance at all to these people or even uh, to myself or to Art or whoever I heard speaking uh, with any opportunities on the street or the sidewalk. There was, oh, I will say that there was one woman I, who I heard complain or grumble or murmur a little bit and then one of the street evangelists or street preachers was kind of saying to her, well, what would you like to hear? Like, this is truth being said and that's about it. What would you like to hear? You know, it's, I think we've been doing too much of this in the church, you know, scratching those itching ears and it's funny, it was the opposite with these masks that like my ears, they felt like they were getting like tugged on by the government and these restrictions and like my ears were sore after wearing that mask. It was, I know <laughs> David and myself, because he was close to me, we were kept getting reminded, oh, sir, you have to put the mask on. It's got no, no, the, the nose too, can't have the nose out. And I could hear her always bugging David and then myself, I was not like, oh, have this thing on, have my fingers under so I can breathe. It's, <laughs> I was starting to have a little bit of a mental meltdown on the way back, I will admit that. Like it was around Winnipeg and I thought, oh, we're halfway there, I got a few more hours in this crazy mask and what if I take it off and just have had it with this and I'm going to lose it? And it's like, Derek, keep it together, keep it together. I'm like, well, what are they going to do, emergency stop and you can't make me, oh, it's just, oh, it's just rising up in me. Like I don't want to wear this crazy mask. Like, like Art was saying, like it's just the, the conviction in us, and it was bothering some of us, no doubt, and we're not used to that. And I know you do feel like a, like a monkey, you do feel like a slave, and you gotta wear this, you gotta do that, and just sit still, and watch TV, and wear your mask, and shut up. And it's like, oh man, like that's how it feels, right? <sighs> so we're already planning, M and I, to go to Vancouver. And I'm thinking like, oh shoot, these crazy masks. It's always a deterrent, maybe we'll drive again. But in any case, jumping back, it was, uh, what did I write down here? The street preachers, I think that was the most encouraging for me. And man, like Art said, we were treated so well and just blessed. And I, I was so blessed to go and to hear the stories of all these street preachers in Toronto and Quebec and Montreal uh, in Ottawa or in the surrounding area there and their battles and what they're doing and their scars and their t-shirts and their videos and just a connecting. And I, I thought, man, I gotta revisit some of my prayers. I'm sure this is an answer to some prayers I've had lately of just uniting uh, the body of Christ and even like the birds of a feather flock together, you know, like we're definitely birds of a feather there. We were what, 15 to 20 street preachers at this, um, at this supper, at a beautiful house out in the bush. They had a pool there. They put on a fireworks show for us. 
Uh, it wasn't like, you know, your Canada Day show, but it was good. I'm not complaining. It was good. <laughs> and when I was over, I was a little like, oh, shit, they were getting going there. It was, it was, yeah, it was pretty good. Anyways, and uh, they had chili, they had pasta, the food kept coming, the snacks, and all of a sudden there was pie, and I, I just felt like, wow, this is, this is something else. I am not used to this treatment, and uh, I, I could get used to that, but uh, yeah, and just praying for the family and just praying for one another, you know, and it was inspiring other people, like what certain, I think it was Jessica, the young girl that just, and bless her heart, she, she was like 14 years old, and she took care of us, she made us food and baked, and she, we were on the road, she'd be like, oh, I got granola bars for whoever's hungry, and I love snacks, and I was like, yes, I love you, I'll take a granola bar, and she was just inspired and, and just really refreshed, um, by us being there, and she's like, man, I just love it how you guys live like this and speak the truth. And I even caught her saying to Art, like, you know, you guys are pretty cool. She says something like that when we were at Parliament Hill the last morning, and I shared that with Em, and <laughs> Em says, wow, if a 14-year-old says you're pretty cool, you know, like at Art's age or how old we are, she's like, well, then you're, yeah, exactly, especially you. <laughs> then you're doing pretty good. You're doing something right. So I was inspired by that, and she was wearing, Art gave her one of the t-shirts, um, repent and convert, and, and she was even feeding some of the homeless on the way out, and speaking on camera and I was just, I was so impressed at the maturity of this young girl and how thoughtful she was towards us and yeah, it wasn't just her, her mom and I think, what's his name, Rick. It, it was just an incredible time to be with everybody, you know, just out there, um, obviously with the preaching and just praying for some people, you know, a few people getting healed. Uh, a guy's shoulder, that's why it took me a while to get into the vehicle. I was saying like, hey, we gotta get going now. And I had a word about this guy's shoulder and I was trying to quickly pray and then Art, you jumped in and then he was checking it out. He's like, wow, it normally clicks, normally gives me trouble. And so just, it was cool, you know, just always some experiences everywhere we go, like Art was sharing earlier with at the theater, that you don't change where you are. And I, I've really been developed as a Christian to be the same way. Like it's not just like on and off like a light switch. Just wherever you are, you're representing Christ. You're preaching. You're praying. You're you're giving people an opportunity to know Him and and to release the Christ and you release that kingdom uh, within you. What else here? Yeah, you know, fun stories. Just again, get to know people more. Like Larry losing his phone at the airport. And <laughs> <laughs> it was, we found it, we found it, but when we get there and all of a sudden it's just like, uh oh, my phone's gone. So then we all go and we're looking and we're asking and we're searching and then Art found it in the vehicle and I mean, praise God for that and we didn't miss our flight and, you know, fortunately the airport wasn't too, too busy. So yeah, you know, and I, I agree with uh, a lot with what Art's saying too, like the church is being judged and obviously being tested through this season and uh, how are we doing with that test, you know? The, the church, yeah, and, and individually with our calling, with our conviction, how are, we, how are we doing with that test? Are we passing that test and if we were failing it, are we repenting and are we, are we turning? Are we going to continue representing Christ at any cost? How are we doing with that? You know, I was reading in Daniel, I'll leave some time here for some of the other fellows to share. And it just, you know, it, it spoke to me in um, what's all going on here. You know, when we were sharing on Parliament Hill, there is um, this fountain. It's really cool. There's a fountain and there's a fire in the center. And it just reminded me of an altar. And I, and I said it there on film, and uh, I'll say it again now to you guys, that I, I really believe that, like, the government needs to get on that altar needs to repent and and even more so because as a church we know better the church we need to get on that altar we need to repent and we need to stay on that altar and be fully consumed with that fire which is our God our God is a consuming fire and that fire purifies us and refines us and makes us holy and we need to remain on that altar I just thought wow that's just so symbolic of this because I was reading through Romans 13 I'm not planning to and I, and I won't but you can in your own time uh, but part of that is when you do right, it says that the government will honor you. And we are being so far from honored, and this government is so far from holy and godly, it's, it's crazy. Like, this government needs to uh, repent. 
So I was reading in Daniel 4, 5, uh, 4 25, it's talking about Nebuchadnezzar and his dream, and then Daniel interprets it as we, we know the story. And I was chatting with him about this, just a few thoughts on the way here. And it reads, you will be driven from human society and you will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow and you will be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn the most high rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. And, you know, driven into the wilderness, and eating, eating grass, and I thought, wow, like Trudeau, like Nenshi, like they need to be driven into the wilderness until they learn that the Most High rules, you know, and, and gives it to anyone he chooses. But then I thought, and I want to add in the second part too, and I just want to present this. He gives them to whoever he chooses, to whoever he chooses, perhaps, and just perhaps, because of, and when you read through Judges, it happens over and over and over. Because of the Israelites, and we're spiritual Israel, because of their unfaithfulness and disobedience, they went into captivity. So maybe, just maybe, because of the church's unfaithfulness and disobedience, we've been given over to this corrupt government. And how much more do we need to repent? How much more do we need to cry out, Lord, we need a deliverer, we need change. So I'm encouraged that Art's talking about another call to repentance. I fully get behind that. Come on out. We need to repent. We, we need to be on fire for Christ and, and to be just fully 100% just for Him and doing His will uh, moving forward. Okay, God bless you guys. Marta, my, my wife waited for me so patiently. Thank you for being there for me. Um, so, a lot has been said, I think pretty much most of it has been said. <clears throat> I kind of approached it from a, a little bit different view, if you, if you may. Um, I felt I was there to watch for, especially at the hands of people. Uh, so that's what I did. A lot of movement. As Art was speaking, uh, we're just walking everywhere behind him to make sure that um, unwel unwelcoming hands will not get near him. And it was at times very, very, uh, the pressure was on because we could hear the enemy shouting, swearing far off, but thank God that somebody with a higher IQ in the police force decided to put a few blocks away because I'm telling you it would have been a slaughter. Um, there were so many patriots and I felt kind of small around them because many of them were twice my size. <laughs> <laughs> so I said well we're gonna win this no matter what uh, especially at that day so I wasn't too much worried even but there were women children Thank God that the police acted the way they should. They were far. So I paid attention kind of to things like uh, when the speech was over and uh, another, I think it was a, a veteran, was speaking after Art. Art's speech was straight to the point. And you know, the, the Word of God says that the Word of God is like a sword. You see, when I hear Art speak, it is sort of like a hammer. And, and why the hammer is needed and what's the hammer is when you take the word of God and you apply it to today. Yeah. And that turns into a hammer that can break obstacles and walls. So his speech was like a hammer breaking these walls. And uh, it was an amazing, amazing uh, speech. It was fired up. It was loud the way it should be. I felt it was like a, like a voice of a father. Listen. Stop or you will be spanked. Repent or you will hurt yourself, unfortunately. So it was a cry of a father. And um, what else was, uh, you know, the devil. The devil uh, came at the third speech. And I'm here to warn every believer and every patriot not to vote libertarian. 
They're from the pit of hell, these guys. Yeah. I'm here to openly say this. Don't vote for them. There is a Christian heritage party out there, a party that stands against homofascism, against indoctrination of children. Now, this guy, while the people were stitching the flag of, quote to quote, stitching the flag of Canada, this dude comes to the pulpit and speaks everything to unstitch it. Yeah. Was unbelievable. I felt like running out there, taking his mic and just kicking him in a, in a leg or something, you know, but yeah, almost, almost, almost did it. Maybe perhaps next time. God will give me more courage to just rebuke him right there. I was waiting after it. I was hunting him to rebuke him, but he was with some, with some TV station and we, we had to go. So maybe next time I'm going to see this dude. You know, shame on you, man. Shame. You're a leader of this party. Shame on you. You know, you're no different than the other compromisers. Yeah. You Judas Iscariot. He's saying homosexuality is this good and culture and this and that and all that. Kind of make it cool. And it is the very thing that we are being judged for. That's right. One of these things, you know. So there were the devils, the wolves in the midst of the rams and sheep, you know, but... But next time, he's going to be called out if I will have the opportunity. So I've noticed that. Uh, amazing people, amazing preachers. And, uh, you know, I've asked all of these hardcore preachers. I said, listen, what do you feel? What is Jesus speaking to you? Is war coming? And they all agreed, yes. Yeah. Yeah, big trouble ahead. Yeah. Big, big trouble ahead. So once again, it, it, it showed me I'm not crazy. Uh, I test the, the spirit, the, the, the word of God says test all spirits and you know they all, and these are men that their life is the gospel, okay, they, they don't play games, that it is, they're out there, they're the shield, they're exposed, you know, the tip of the sword and they all agreed to, to get ready because uh, tough times are coming. So what else was there? Everything else you pretty much heard. Um, it's getting real. I'll tell you, it's getting real. I hope next year, uh, if we will have the ability and capability, if still there's going to be no war or chaos, um, that we'll be able to be, you know, 100 times more. 100 times more. They set up a wall. There was a wall that was separating us from the Parliament Hill. <laughs> uh, they, uh, half of the grass was, was dig out. It was just like all of a sudden they had to start a construction project, which then I hear it's going to take five years. Yeah. Are you serious? There is a huge wall set up, you know, in front of the Parliament and it's supposed to take five years. What are these uh, traitors doing? Are they digging out uh, the Bible that is on the foundation, like it's happening in Calgary here? Uh, what are what? What they're gonna chisel out the, the 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 Ten Commandments and all of that stuff? They're gonna make it modern. I have no idea, but we have to look at their hands. Another thing that I want to mention is that uh, Kevin Jane Johnson uh, he wants to move to Calgary which was great. The man needs to be saved. Hey, if you're listening, you better be saved or you're going to stand before judgment, man. And as uh, cool as you are and eloquent and uh, gifted, you will go to hell. So, brother, <laughs> repent, receive Jesus. But he's going to be running for a mayor of Calgary. Um, so may God give him the strength. I know he can do some turmoil within the enemy's camp. But at the same time, here is uh, our Christian mayor, for sure, in the spirit, Larry Heather. So, for sure, you have my back. You're my brother, first and most of all. Know this, because I, I've noticed you were a little bit sad <laughs> at one point. You have our back, okay? First and most of all, we support you, brother. So, a brother is going to be running for a mayor. Uh, I want to be running for a counselor, and I hope that... Derek, I'm throwing this challenge and the, this glove uh, your way. Me, 
and other and uh, Kelly, I mean, we should be running for office, guys. With the Lord, we can do such revolution next election that she's gonna just run, <laughs> just run from uh, Alberta. So that was encouraging that there is a stir up that the people are are. Uh, some are uh, warriors are moving here to this province. In United we stand, divided we fall. Remember that, you know. So a lot of other things happen. Stephanie and your husband and your daughter, your amazing people stick together, especially to what's coming. That's a message to you. May God, uh, you know, it says when you receive a prophet, you shall receive, receive the reward of the prophet. And uh, may you receive a blessing. May you never lack for your uh, hospitality. And may God richly bless you and your daughter and your sons. May God bless you and keep you. So I think uh, that's from my perspective, that's what I... So there were three weasels, um, Antifa, that sneaked in through the cracks. But... <laughs> But, you know, you just, like hyenas, just yeah. ignore as much as possible. Yet we show them that, hey, you come too close, you will be bitten by a lion. And, and we just, we just kind of, we were wanted to defuse the situation. We just walked and, of course, with the phone in almost in our faces, I told them, hey, two meters, right? Let's stick by the rules. <laughs> You're too close. <laughs> so we kind of passed. We went back to the Parliament Hill and. They went their own way and praise God, you know, we don't want to, we are not there to fight. We are there to defend and stand and guard for thee. Amen. But at the same time, we, we are not uh, people to be pushed around. Amen. So, eh, bless you. You know, I said to them when they said, uh, I want to fight you. I would turn to them and I would say, don't tempt me, please. <laughs> oh, now I am a monkey with a tether. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, oh, I just want to mention our brother Dave Hughes back here. Dave is such a godly man and patient with us. <laughs> he, we were, he was trying to get us to get through uh, the departure lounge and get to where we're going. He, he took care of all the tickets and all the details, the baggage claim and everything. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much. You're a rock. <laughs> you kept us on schedule uh, somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> until we weren't on schedule. But uh, yeah, I want to mention the fellowship with the street preachers was phenomenal yeah. to see these uh, three guys from Cornwall and the guy that got uh, arrested or got a ticket for holding Passover. Some neighbors saw them through the window and phoned the cops on them, the five people. Like, you know, uh, and uh, two brothers from Quebec, young guys, but preachers, and have with the gift of healing, one of them, you know. He uh, healed the guy from Cornwall with his leg. Uh, I mean, God healed through him, through the gift of healings. So, uh, and uh, even uh, this last uh, March for Jesus, there's uh, Sonia, our, our, my Spanish friends, Sonia and his, or her husband, Rick, brought out a uh, Maria, and uh, she was so much difficulty with her knee, and the doctor even thought she might have cancer in the knee. <laughs> and she was out there dancing <laughs> at the dance like nobody's business, and God healed her during the march. So we... So we hope to have Maria here to give her testimony next week. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the fellowship with the Patriots as well, to see people standing up for Canada, uh, unashamed, you know, willing to, to take persecution, risk, 
And like I say, one patriot got attacked at his coming out of his hotel at about seven in the morning, and uh, they were waiting for him. Five people beat him up, and so we remember him in prayer. I don't even know his name. Um, I'd like to turn to the last chapter of Lamentations. It's a prayer for restoration. And I, I just started studying it this morning, actually, and I was amazed at how relevant this is. The, vo the verse in particular, verse 14 of Lamentations 5, the elders have left the city gate, the young man their music. The elders have left the city gate, the young man, their music. That's, that's significant. If we go back to verse 7, just get the context. Our fathers sinned, they no longer exist. They've passed on. But we bear their punishment. Talk about Canada's deficit and, and debt. <laughs> uh, slaves rule over us. People who are slaves to sin, to addiction even pedophilia. They're ruling over us. No one rescues us from their hands. We secure our food at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. We're hiding in the wilderness sometime. Our skin is hot as an oven, just like Arthur preaching in <laughs> hot as an oven from the ravages of hunger. Women are raped in Zion, girls in the cities of Judah. Princes are hung up by their hands. Elders are showing no respect. Young men labor at millstones. Boys stumble under loads of wood. And then the verse. The elders have left the city gate. The young men, their music. Now you can kind of understand from the context. The young men are, are in enslavement. They, there's no time for merriment. There's no time for recreation for arts and crafts or anything else. Uh, they've been totally distracted. Uh, and the boys are, are even uh, oppressed. So life in the Old Testament, Jewish Jerusalem, involved two main focal points. The temple for the worship of God, led by God's appointed leadership, the priests and the Levites, and the city gates, where the civic elders, government officials, announced their rulings made deliberations, made pronouncements. Now, Ottawa is the national capital gate of the city of the nation of Canada. Calgary, we have our city hall downtown. We have parliament in Ottawa, where it's a, like a city gate. Besides being part of the city's protection against invaders, city gates were places of central activities in biblical times. It was at the city gates that important business transactions were made. Court was convened, and public announcements were heralded. Accordingly, it is natural that the Bible frequently speaks of sitting in the gate or of activities that took place at the gate. In Proverbs 1, wisdom in the gateways of the city, she makes her speech to spread her words to the maximum number of people. Wisdom took to the gates. That's what we did this last uh, midweek here, by going to Ottawa. The first mention of a city gate is found in Genesis 19.1. It was at the gate of Sodom that Abraham's nephew, Lot, greeted the angelic visitors to his city. Lot was there with other leading men of the city, either discussing the day's issues or engaging important civic business. In the law of Moses, parents of a rebellious son were told to bring him to the city gate, where the elders would examine the evidence and pass judgment. Deuteronomy uh, 21, 18 to 21. This affirms that the city gate was central to what? Community action. So what happens when Christians aren't at the city gate? Do they influence community action? If we stay in the four walls of our church, do they influence what's going on outside? Well, yes, by our prayers. But are our prayers going no higher than the ceiling? If we refuse to go out and apply our prayers in action? 
Another important example in the book of Ruth, in Ruth 4, 1 to 11, Boaz officially claimed the position of kinsman redeemer by meeting with the city elders at the gate of Bethlehem. There the legal matters related to his marriage to Ruth were settled at the gate. And that was a very important link to the messianic uh, line that led to Jesus. But as Israel combated the Philistines, the priest Eli wanted waited at the city gate for news regarding the ark and to hear how his sons fared in the battle. They didn't do very well, and the ark was lost. When King David ruled Israel, he stood before his troops to give instructions from the city gate. 2 Samuel 18, 1-5, after his son Absalom died, David mourned, but eventually returned to the city gate along with his people. The king's appearance at the gate signaled that the morning was over and the king was once again attending to the business of governing. Would it be so for our prime minister, Justin Trudeau? The COVID virus has him locked in his cottage of 22, his cottage of 22 rooms. <laughs> yeah, he's not attending par parliament hardly ever. So the city gate was important in other ancient cultures as well. Esther 2, 5 to 8 records that some of the king's servants plotted at the king's gate to murder Mordecai, a leading Jew in Persia, heard the plot and reported it to the king, or reported to Esther who gave the news to the king. So uh, you, you learn things when you're down at city hall, yeah. believe it or not. You even learn that there's a conversion therapy ban coming down the pike. And you, you're there at the first when you see their true nature and motives when they present it as a motion. Uh, to control the gates of one's enemies was to control their city. Part of Abraham's blessing from the Lord was the promise that your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. What a promise for us. What a promise as we, as David talked about Christian participation in elections. It's so vital, it's so important. And you might think, oh, I don't have a hope. Yeah, well, uh, that's me for 24, 23 elections at all levels. Oh, I don't have a hope. Larry, why do you bother running? Well, Larry, why are you running against Preston Manning? Isn't he a Christian? Why, why are you running against Preston Manning? Well, he, he didn't stand up for pro-life. He didn't stand up for biblical absolutes. Larry, why are you running against Ralph Klein? Larry, why are you running against Jason Kenney twice? Larry, Larry, why are you running against Stephen Harper six times? Why? Why? We have a good under the conservatives, right? Like, look where his stable leadership led us to. Good Lord. Good Lord, have mercy on our nation. As Jesus promised to build his church, he said, the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Matthew 16, 18, an understanding of the biblical implications of gates helps us interpret Jesus' words. Since a gate was a place where rulers met and counsel was given, Jesus was saying that all the evil plans of Satan himself could never defeat the church. We're at the gates of Haiti. We can interfere with the business. We can interrupt the counselors with hard truths. We must be a people whose elders return to the city gates so that the young men and women may have a reason for making music there. <laughs> and we're going down even this afternoon for this anti-police rally. We're going to make music and preach. So... We're going to, uh, you know, Pastor Arthur's going to end in, uh, in prayer for us here. But I thank God for the opportunity to go with this team, six of us, down to uh, Ottawa and not get Ottawashed, but get Ottawise, you know. You get Ottawise, not Ottawashed. <laughs> Good day. God bless. God bless you all. Um, hopefully you guys could hear me. I'm like Moses, I don't speak in public. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm here to speak on the defunding the police. 
Uh, my daughter, uh, she graduated as a psychologist uh, from the University of Calgary, and uh, she works in the 911 department, and she was saying that there's, it's impossible for them to defund the police because they actually need more funding. Yeah. And uh, it's just common sense to, for them to have more fundings because they need people in the, the police, I mean, in the police department to be educated for like the, the special, like uh, for psychology work, like have a program for police officers to train for that specific uh, situation so they don't have to send workers and like social workers to go in on, you don't know what you're going in on. So they have to be equipped as a police officer and the police officer needs uh, this in the police department. So they need more fundings to, to refund, like, you know, to, to more or less, you need to redo certain um, things in the police department, like create different uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, that's what they need. So uh, for these people calling out defunding, they don't even have a clue what they're asking for. Uh, it's a mess. So, um, and my family moved here from Jamaica 45 years ago. We've never had a problem with police officers. Uh, they're actually very good. Uh, we have more problems outside of the police department with, with problems uh, because uh, I know when we were growing up and we were in the world and we used to go, we used to have uh, uh, dance and the people would call the police to come in to shut us down and the police would come in and they just tell us to turn our music down and half of the time they looked like they wanted to stay and enjoy themselves. <laughs> so like uh, to defund the police is a big no-no. And uh, with uh, this COVID-19 uh, that's going on, it definitely is a setup to mess up people. Uh, what they're, they're doing, especially in the States, they're inflating the numbers. Uh, a lot of people that has gone in, that there's a lot of false reading, false positive going on.